the tibial plateau leveling osteotomy is the most commonly performed surgery in veterinary orthopedics. And we're going to walk through step by step uh, how it's performed. And the, the, the first part of, of it is uh, the diagnosis. And, and the diagnosis is based on physical examination, clinical signs, and x-rays. And on x-rays, you cannot see the actually torn ACL, uh, but you can see signs that are representative of that. And I've got an x-ray here to show you. And what we see is uh, fluid accumulation and or scar tissue within the joint that shows up as a gray mass effect in the joint. We see the bone spurs on the end of the patella very commonly. Those bone spurs are not causing a problem, but they're a sign that the joint's chronically inflamed, and 99% of chronically inflamed canine stifle joints have ACL disease. Uh, we also see that the femur is slid back on the tibial plateau. Now, in the previous illustration, we saw in a complete ACL tear where the femur can slide all the way off of the back, but that's not typically what we see on an x-ray. So the x-ray in most cases is suggestive but not definitive for the diagnosis. And the definitive diagnosis comes with arthroscopy which happens at the beginning of surgery in the operating room. So once we're to the point that we feel that this patient almost for sure has an ACL tear, we move to general anesthesia. And general anesthetics these days are extremely safe. Uh, once the patient's under general anesthesia, we then do a morphine epidural. So it's a local morphine effect that deadens the nerves that go to the knee. It allows us to use less anesthetic and it allows our patients to wake up comfortably enough to go home on the day of surgery. Once the epidural's completed, we take very specific x-rays under anesthesia to make measurements and do some preoperative planning on exactly how we're going to do the TPLO. Uh, we then shave or clip the leg from hip to ankle and move into the operating room, prep the leg with an iodine solution, put drapes around the leg so we only have a sterile field to work within, and then we start with arthroscopy. And arthroscopy involves a small poke hole and then a scope inserted into the joint and then a view on the TV monitor to inspect all the structures in the joint, make 100% sure of our diagnosis, make sure there's no meniscal pathology, and evaluate the overall cartilage health for osteoarthritis at that point. And I have uh, several arthroscopic videos to show. The first is uh, a normal ACL, and in this case, uh, we're probing the normal ACL. We see nice blood vessels within it. The fibers are nice and tight. The ligament's tight. We see its base of insertion there. Uh, and then uh, we'll look here at the posterior cruciate ligament, which almost never is involved in, in canine stifle disease. And again, this nice broad base of attachment of the ACL. So it's quite a large ligament. That's what an intact ligament looks like. Next, we'll look at one that is torn, and here we see the ligament that has pulled apart, almost like a mop head being pulled apart, with large and small fibers, with hemorrhage within the joint, and this represents a full, complete ACL tear. Once we've made a definitive diagnosis, then we move ahead with the, the, the tibial plateau leveling osteotomy, or TPLO, and I'm going to walk through that with you step by step. But before we do that, I'd like to give you an overview of the procedure. So this is the illustration that we've seen numerous times throughout this presentation. And during weight bearing, we see the femur slide down and back, tearing the ACL. The surgical procedure involves making a curved bone cut in the tibia and rotating the top section until the tibial plateaus level then securing that section with a bone plate. The bone heals wonderfully, like it was never cut. Uh, the bone plate becomes obsolete after months, but we usually don't feel it's necessary to remove it. Uh, so that's an overview. I'd, I'd like to walk you through kind of how this goes step by step. 
So once the patient's in the operating room, the leg's draped in, we make a small surgical approach to the medial side or inner side of the tibia. And I'm gonna use my plastic model illustrations again. And so there's a small surgical approach made. It's in an average size lab. It would be uh, four to five inches. Once we make the surgical approach to the bone, we're then ready to proceed with making our cut and doing the rotation. Most surgeons use a device called a jig. And the jig is placed on the leg using small pins to hold it in position. And the purpose of the jig is once we've made our cut, is to hold the bone in appropriate alignment. Not all surgeons use a jig, I do, um, and, uh, but it's, it's personal preference. So once we have the jig in place, then we'll use an oscillating saw. And we have a variety of these saw blades, and, and in fact, we have about 10 different sizes, and we can place them appropriately on the bone and they just vibrate and oscillate in a fine motion to make a very precise cut. So that's what the next model shows, is that that's what we've, we've done. We've performed the osteotomy, and you can see that's where the osteotomy was performed, and we see that that section of bone now we can rotate. So based on preoperative measurements, we rotate it an appropriate amount, and then with it in that new level position, we fix it in place with a bone plate. And bone plates come in a variety of sizes and shapes, uh, and also in about 10 different sizes and shapes. They're made of either surgical stainless steel, which is most common, which is what this plate is, or of titanium. And then there's some other really unique factors that, that are coming into play with today's bone plating technology. And one is locking screws. This is, has been a big advancement in, in veterinary orthopedics in general and human orthopedics, but very specifically with the, the tibial plateau leveling. And so the way that this screw works is this screw has threads on its head. And then of course it has threads that engage the bone. So as we put the screw in and tighten it, it will go into the bone, but then it also tightens into the plate, and it secures into the plate. So it's very rigid, and it's called locking plate technology, and it improves uh, immediate post-operative comfort, it improves the time to healing, uh, and it's been a great innovation. So that's, that's the plate that, that, that we put on, and I have the final model that shows the plate in place, with the rotated top segment, uh, and, that's what the, and that's what the final product looks like. We'd be looking at that much of it through the surgical approach. Once we're there, we, we test for joint stability and make sure that that thrusting motion that we've illustrated before is gone, uh, and then close the, the incision. And the incision's closed with uh, buried sutures that do not need removal. Uh, and from there, we move into x-ray and take an x-ray to make sure, a radiograph, to make sure that the placement uh, of the plate is correct and the tibial plateau's level. And I have an illustration of that. So we move to the x-ray and here we have uh, an example of a level tibial plateau. We actually shoot for about five degrees, but a relatively level tibial plateau. Uh, with the bone plate in place. Our patients go home the day of surgery, usually about two hours after surgery, uh, and the night of surgery, they're very comfortable because of the epidural, but they're very sleepy. So most go home, find their favorite spot to sleep, and go to bed for the night. Uh, and most sleep through the night. Uh, some go home, and if they're a typical lab, they want to have a half a dinner before they go to bed. Uh, but in general, they're very comfortable. We do have here at CCO a 24-7 ICU, but as a dog lover, I think most dogs are happier at home, uh, and the epidural allows us to, to do that. The next morning, again, if it's a two-year-old lab, they're probably looking for their tennis ball, uh, and so they they're, they're make a remarkable improvement over the first 12 to 24 hours. But uh, older dogs are not completely themselves for a day or two. But by 72 hours, virtually all the patients are back to their same level of energy, personalities back, 
they're still limping, but, uh, but overall doing well. Uh, they, they do wear the cone of shame uh, for about a week so that they won't lick their skin incision. Uh, but that uh, is usually not a really big problem. And in those weeks after surgery, they are most happy to be on some form of pain meds. And we really use two things. We use an anti-inflammatory drug. Remedil is the most common example. Uh, and many patients are happiest to be on that for up to six weeks, but it's variable. We also use a non-narcotic pain reliever, most commonly tramadol, which we would use uh, for approximately 10 days.